event tonight called Rewriting the Future, Social Justice and Science Fiction at the Independent Publishing Resource Center. The night is going to be two different sort of events that talk about science fiction from a feminist standpoint. The first is a half hour conversation with myself as the moderator between Walida and Marisha um, and Grace Dillon, who are both awesome sci-fi scholars. And then after that, we're going to do a writing exercise with Walida and Grace leading two groups of writing. And then those writings from that exercise are going to be made immediately into a zine about science fiction that everyone's going to take home at the end of the night. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out to this event. It's called Rewriting the Future, Social Justice and Science Fiction. Grace wanted to start us out with a few words. Do you want to go, Grace? Wadabawe, that's one word that we have in my language, Anishinaabemowin. I'm Anishinaabe, and uh, my family is actually from three nations. Uh, Sioux Chippewa in Ontario, Garden River in Ontario, and Bay Mills Nation in the Upper Peninsula. Um, and the sweet grass that's being passed around is uh, something that my daughter and I gathered this summer. And uh, it's, as we say with sweetgrass, uh, it actually comes to you rather than you finding it. And so we were very honored um, to have the sweetgrass come to us. And so please feel free to smudge yourself. We view it as a real blessing. Um, in this month, past the Nakwe Gizas, past the moon of the falling leaves, we have stories that are mishkiki that are medicine or strength of the earth. And all that I share with you will be my own language in Nishinaabemowin this time around. Uh, there are certain aesthetics that we have within storytelling that have profound cleansing and healing capabilities. So it's not just the sweet grass that you smudge with that cleanses you and heals you. It is stories themselves especially, I feel, science fiction, since I'm tenured in that, <laughs> and really enjoy it. Um, and stories of reclamation, Iko Indewase, Bajigat. In the old times, the artists were the keepers of memory, the recorders of events, the mark makers of prayers, and the shaman who brought the unseen world into view. That is a direct quote from Jane Quick to See Smith, an amazing, amazing Native artist that is in our area here, if you have not seen her work. Relationships between image and word and story are part of our ancient and Anishinaabe traditions. Pictographs and knowledge pre-contact recorded in petroglyphs and birch bark scrolls. Now we have contemporary quill and beadwork now we have stories, indigenous stories, that are science fiction. Stories become roots. They are eco bijig bagijatam. Medicine people are approached, and they are approached with plants and medicinal knowledge in a meticulously systematic way. And I feel that we too, with indigenous science fictions and indigenous futurisms, that is our very reality of justice and social justice. We live social justice by creating stories that are mishkaki, that are medicine. We are like the artists, and together we harvest a multiplicity of plants, of anything which has um, any kind of ephemeral kind of season or elliptical or allegorical, which is actually the very nature of the language that I grew up with. We're always oblique and allegorical and poetic. So that when you have a science fiction writer like Tracy, who got her Pulitzer Prize, let's see, you can see I've got many, many books here. <laughs> Uh, ah. Life on Mars by Tracy K. Smith. Just absolutely amazing. I'll start passing around some of these books for you. Um, these become very important. Mishkiki Kiwe um, or Mishkiki Winini, where you are both artist and storyteller, observing the world, 
around yourself in ephemeral ways that create meaning from an otherwise unintelligible existence. So, Dabasan Divisa is humility. Humility in learning to speak in Mishkaki, speak in medicine by stories, by being bundle carriers of stories of the future. Iko Mishwahuisi, Bagijigan, stories become then reflections of that. And they are debate one, they are truth. They become both tech contextual, as Walida will be sharing with us, and they become personal. We become the bundle carriers. The stories become the Mishkiki. And in the process of simply telling stories, we all, Gaki Na Wiwe, we are all related. We all are in the process of decolonization, Biska Biyang, which literally in our language means to return to the woods. Well, thank you so much, Grace, um, for starting us out with that blessing and those words. Um, so how do those ideas, we just heard some really beautiful sort of ideas about how stories become roots, how stories are a medicine, these cultural ideas about how stories influence our societies and our ideas about ourselves. So how do you apply that framework and that kind of thinking to mainstream pop culture? Like when you're watching Battlestar Galactica or when you're watching Star Wars, are those ideas running through your head and how do you apply that kind of analysis to the stuff we're watching on TV? Uh, okay, well, uh, first of all, I have to admit, as much as I love Star Trek and my Indigenous Futurisms course, we start off with the episode uh, Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are familiar with that one. Uh, <laughs> can, can you just explain what happened because I haven't seen it. I'm gonna let. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think an Indian should be telling uh, that story. <laughs> I know. I'm like I don't want to. <laughs> so many, so many problematic things in the originals, in in all of Star Trek, but the originals here. Um, so uh, Captain Kirk goes to a planet and ends up losing his memory from this machine and then ends up going native. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> he, you know, it's like a very fake, you know, generic indigenous community there and he becomes one of their, you know, warriors and gets some ridiculous name and runs around in buckskin and it's just awful. <laughs> And as an avatar, of course, becomes the rescuer. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's all I want to say about that. So, so, Grace, when you watch that in your class, what, what do you tell the students to pay attention to while they're watching it? And, and how do you respond to that kind of thing? Well, what's interesting is, even with the laughs that we have here, right, I don't even have to do any directing. We simply watch the episode. and. After having read so many indigenous uh, science fiction stories, it's almost glaring the way that the, ch the, the, the kind of features that show up. Um, and so part of it is that um, I really, really embrace forms of Afrofuturism, indigenous futurism, Chicano Latino futurism, Asian futurism, so many other forms. There's a new three-body uh, problem novel that just came out by a Chinese writer that's been translated into English. And um, I really, really embrace those forms of science fiction because they inevitably give um, the kind of emphasis on social justice that you've been working so strongly with, Walida, and that is, I think, a theme for tonight. And it's just there because we live it every day. We're struggling and we're doing forms of survivance with it every day. So it's just inherently within our stories. I just, um, I just want to say, I mean, I actually think that the Star Trek um, franchise is a great example to talk about sort of uh, mainstream sci-fi at its best and at its worst. <laughs> all rolled up in one. And like, let's be clear, I love Star Trek. I am a Trekkie. Uh, my earliest memory is watching Star Trek, uh, the episode Who Mourns for Adonis, 
not a great one, but you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, I, you know, I, I speak a little bit of Klingonese, just a little bit though, you know, not. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I could, I could do just kaplach as, you know, welcome and, and hello and a greeting to you all. Um, so, but, you know, I think that Star Trek originally, you know, they were trying to sell it to the networks as a wagon train to the stars. That's the way that they were phrasing it, right? And I think that that's incredibly important because, you know, really science fiction and westerns, carry the same motifs, right? This, you know, this rugged individualist going into the wilderness encountering, uh, you know, uh, harsh dangers and aliens and, and you know, in, in whatever, you know, fucked up way that's framed, um, you know, and, and, you know, white people triumphing over all of it and, and subduing it and, and bending it to its will, right? And, and enacting manifest destiny either on, you know, the American West or upon the entire universe and any other universes around. So, you know, I think that that's important because, you know, that, that is an incredibly colonial mindset and that's what a lot of our mainstream science fiction gives us, right? We, you know, we pretend we're like, we can shut our brains off and just go to this other world that, oh, actually it looks a lot <laughs> like our world in all of the jacked up ways. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's really important to recognize that science, fi science fiction is made out of this world, right? And we have to be conscious about we're what we're making. If we're not conscious about what we're making, then we're remaking the same institutionalized oppression that exists here in this world. And so for, for us, for Octavia's Brood, um, which is the anthology that I'm, ed I'm, I'm co-editing, science fiction stories from social justice movements, and we got postcards, which is so exciting. So if you want a postcard, you can have them. I didn't want to just give them to you, because if you don't want it, um, I, I want them. <laughs> so, so if you want one, please please take it. Um, but you know, if you don't, don't feel pressure. I won't be checking your bag on the way out. Um, but uh, you know, our, our idea behind that, my co-editor, Adrian Marie Brown, and, and I, was uh, to have sci uh, science fiction written by organizers, visionaries, change makers, activists. Because what we realized and what we felt was that all organizing is science fiction. I mean, dreaming of worlds where there's no poverty, where there's no prisons, where there's no police or police violence, um, where there's no you know, heterosexism, where there's no patriarchy and oppression, that's science fiction, right? That doesn't exist. None of us have ever seen that. But being able to collectively dream of those worlds actually allows us <clears throat> to collectively begin to build those worlds into reality. So we think everyone who engages in any sort of organizing is already a science fiction creator. And conversely, we feel like our movements for social change desperately need science fiction. They need a space to break beyond the boundaries of what we're told is realistic change, right? I actually had a student ask me, um, I t I'm teaching a history of the Black Panther Party class right now, and we're at the end, so it's, you know, it's real depressing, you know, everything is it's terrible. I feel horrible every time I walk into class. I'm like, I'm gonna just destroy your world for four hours, you guys, I'm so sorry. Uh, and one of the students was like, well, you know, I mean, realistically, how can you believe that any change is gonna happen? And I'm like, so realistically, you actually can't believe any change is gonna happen. And he was like, seriously, you're gonna say that to me? And I was like, because all real, true, transformative, deep-seated systemic change is utterly unrealistic, right? Every single group of folks who are struggling to make that change were told, this is impossible, this will never happen. You need to get some realistic goals, right? I mean, Adrian and I are both black women, and so for us, we think of enslaved black folks in this country who, to who were told again and again and again, you will never be free. It is impossible to dream of freedom. The most you can hope for is a tiny bit better condition in your, your enslavement, a kinder, gentler slavery. That's as much as you can get, reform, right? And those enslaved black folks said, absolutely not. We reject that entirely, and we will remake this entire world to get our freedom. And they absolutely did that to create us, you know? And so I think it's incredibly important that our movements move beyond these two-year grant cycles these five-year strategic plans, <clears throat> and begin to think 50 and 100 years and 200 years in the future to be visionary and to break beyond the boundaries of, you know, well, is this a realistic plan or not? Like, let's not put chains on our dreams, right? Like, let's let our dreams go 
And that, you know, because there are enough constraints in this world, you know, I mean, supposedly we can't have transporters. So, you know, I mean, physics constrains us. So, so we don't need to do that anymore for ourselves. <laughs> if I could add just a footnote that this is the kind of conversation going on in the many nations that I'm traveling with. There are many uh, chiefs, there are many leaders, there are those of us, this book just came out called The Winter We Danced, which is engaging in the Idle No More movement and other social justice movements that we've been working with. And that's exactly what is being talked about is all of a sudden they're very interested in my science fiction because they're realizing, aha, with science fiction, we can actually put into story form, which is what we do all the time, things that really could take place 50 to 100 years from now. What kind of world do we really want to see? What do we want to work towards? Yeah. Um, well, that later this week you had an interview in Yes Magazine where you talked about um, how it's important to shift our thinking in the state. You're talking about Ferguson, how it's important to shift our thinking away from the state keeping us safe because that has never been the purpose of the police or the prison system and begin to ask, how can we keep each other safe? And so I wanted to ask you, as we deal with sort of the Eric Garner indictment and, and, my, and the lack of an indictment from Michael Brown, how, how can sci-fi help us grapple with the real world violence and tragedy that we have, that we have, these day, that we have today? Um, I mean, I think again that that ability to step outside of what we're told is realistic is incredibly important. I mean, we are seeing, you know, we are seeing the sy system functioning as it always has functioned. Um, and it doesn't make it any less heartbreaking every single time it happens, right? Someone on Twitter was like, it's not surprising and it's still absolutely heartbreaking. And I think that that is important to hold both of those. Um, but you know, I think that, that what we're being offered, right? So folks are like, this shouldn't happen. So we need to reform the grand jury system. We need to, you know, like, let's get into the most nitty gritty nuances of shifts that need to change about, you know, this, part of this statute, let's talk about, well, maybe, maybe it's because the police are militarized. Because, you know, I mean, they don't kill people with their bare hands. Oh, wait, they do. They do kill <laughs> with their bare hands. So it's not the militarization, right? Because So we're offered all of these reforms that actually keep us away from the real point. And the real point is the system is not broken. It's operating exactly to, as it was intended. There is no ability to reform racism and uh, you know oppression out of the system because that is the foundation of the system. Uh, it's the lifeblood of the system. So instead, we have to step outside of the system and say, well, then what do we want? So no to this, no to any of this. What do we actually want? And you know, I'm a prison abolitionist. I believe in the ending of all prisons. I believe in community accountability processes. And when I say that to people, People look at me like I rode in on a unicorn sliding down a rainbow. They're like, oh, boo boo. That's so cute. Look at you with your little prison abolition. You know, and then they're like, um, okay, so, you know, yeah, maybe prisons don't work the best, but we don't have anything else. So, you know, get used to prisons. And I think that that thinking is what allows the system to continue functioning as it does and has it ha as it has for hundreds of years. So what we actually need to do is say there are as many options outside of the prison system to keep us safe, to address harm that's done in our communities, to heal individuals and communities as we can think of. There are infinite opportunities, right? Um, infinite diversity and infinite combination if we are going to go with the Vulcan Idic symbol, right y'all? <laughs> I'm like, the Vulcans, they know. Not the, not the non-emotional part, but the other parts, they know. You know so I think it's, it's incredibly important. This is a moment to step outside of, of the system, to step outside of it and to say, this is, if this is the system functioning as it is intended, then what do we actually want and how do we begin to go about building it? And I think the re that the response of the folks, um, you know, starting in Ferguson and now spreading across the country to New York, around the world, um, in response to this, and specifically the leadership of black youth has been incredible because these black youth are rejecting 
these uh, narratives about how they should rebel, right? These narratives of, well, this is what is acceptable rebellion. This is what is realistic rebellion. This is what is realistic change that you can hope for, right? And I think that they're getting this from all sides. They're getting this from white allies, who, you know, in quotes, white allies who are telling them, well, this is what you should do. They're getting this from, you know, older generations of black folks who are, you know, enmeshed in a politics of respectability, which is really a politics of assimilation. And they reject all of that. And they said, we will define for ourselves how we struggle and how we engage. And we are actually in the process of building an entirely new movement for justice right now, rooted in the history of, of the past, you know, as Grace was talking about, um, that is gonna propel us into new futures. And so I think that these are absolutely incredible visionary organizers, and I'm so thankful for them for standing so strong and, um, and not compromising that visionary perspective. Yeah, let's get some <laughs> oh, so we're, we're just talking about how science fiction can help us imagine a different reality, a whole different world. And I wanna hear from you two, what was the first time when when you read a science fiction book or watched a piece of science fiction and it made you rethink the world as you know it, to question what you thought you knew? Okay, well, uh, I, what I think of, and it's interesting, I ended up writing an article on Ray Bradbury, um, who of course has walked on and we all dearly loved. and. Uh, when I was little growing up, the stories I grew up on in Anishinaabe Moan uh, were, I'm realizing, uh, quite science fiction. I mean, we were <coughs> going off to the stars, <laughs> doing all kinds of things in the stars, coming back, we're in multi-dimensions, we're in all of those kinds of things. And uh, I read Ray Brad Bradbury when I was very little at a we were in a school where we just taught ourselves, and there just happened to be all kinds of adult books lying around, and so I happened to pick up Ray Bradbury and really fell in love with a lot of his ideas. And it was later on when I grew up that I discovered that his wife was Cherokee and that a lot of her Cherokee ideas were implanted throughout his writings. And so that was a very exciting, so that's what I kind of go back to, is that moment where you know, I was out and there were flies going up this window and I was reading it among, you know, I don't know, cows and <laughs> all kinds of things out in the area, deer, uh, uh, we had moose coming on down, you know, <laughs> and there he was, and I thought, wow, and I just sat down, and it just inspired me to, which is what we hope to have you guys do, it just inspired me to just sit and start writing and start visioning. Um, so uh, our, our collection is named for Octavia Butler, um, who is a black feminist science fiction writer, um, MacArthur Genius Award winner, and just, you know, amazing visionary and we feel we, we created the term visionary fiction to kind of be a blanket term um, that covers sci-fi speculative fiction um, horror uh, fantasy magical realism alternate history you know basically if it's weird shit it's us and <laughs> if it helps us envision new worlds it's visionary fiction right um, and so we, we think that Octavia Butler is um, you know, one of the most amazing examples of visionary fiction that her work just in, uh, constantly keeps those principles at the core. So she was someone who was very influential to me. But I would say, I think that the first uh, science fiction book that I read that really um, allowed me to envision an entirely new world was Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time. Um, and so I read that in, in high school and, uh, you know, it's this uh, woman ends up traveling to the future, maybe, or maybe she's, you know, dealing with traveling in her own mind, who knows. But it's this, you know, it's this whole different society where people live, you know, in community, in communion with one another, you know, the, um, there's no hierarchy. And there were two things that really stood out to me um, about it. One was um, maybe a little shallow, but you know, because I had read 1984, I would read like some of these other books where these, you know, so-called communal futures 
are terrible, right? We just all walk around, it's gray, as in the giver, and you know, and then we kill babies, apparently, because that's what people do when they don't have uh, leaders, they just start killing babies. And, um, you know, so it's just gray and drab, and everyone has to wear uniforms, right? And there's nothing pretty or individual about anyone, and I think that this is actually some of the most effective, you know, anti-radical uh, propaganda that's out there is in these books, right? In these youth books. The fact that all, like, every kid has read The Giver, I'm like, damn you! <laughs> You win this one, because, I mean, that is just some of the most effective, you know, anti-communal, anti-socialist, anti-whatever radical propaganda. Uh, but, you know, so, so I was like, you know, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I clearly um, have color and style, and, or I have my own style. I don't know if you guys think I have style. And, you know, and I was like, I don't want to, I can't do all that. I can't wear a uniform that everyone else is wearing. I'm going to have to, like, tie a scarf around it or something. And uh, so in March Piercy, they have these things called flimsies. And they're dresses. They're these, like, fabulous outfits, not just dresses, fa fabulous outfits that are made out of algae. And you wear it for one night, and then you compost it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. This is the only vision of a radical future I'd seen where, where, where individuality, creativity, and beauty, and style were, were important, right? I think that style is actually creativity, culture, and art as well. And so I, you know, I thought that that was amazing. They had a lending library of beautiful things. So you could, have, you know, you, could, you could check out a Van Gogh, and it was hanging on your wall for a month, and then you return it, and then you could get, you know, um, you know, a, a Kara Walker and hang that on your wall and return it. And I was like, that's amazing. And the other thing was that they had uh, gender neutral uh, pronouns, which I had never heard, uh, I'd never heard of before. And so instead of saying his or her, they say per, you know, oh, this is per's books. Oh, per, for, per uh, forgot per's bag, right? And I was like, this is brilliant. Why is everyone not doing this? <laughs> I literally, I, I had no conception that, you know, obviously people have been having these conversations for a really long time. I was like, this is it, you guys, this is it. <laughs> and I went to high school, y'all, and I, I tried to, I tried to do it. I was like, oh, Per forgot Per's book bag. And people were like, I'm sorry, are you a fucking cat? Why are you purring? I like, I it, right? Um, so it didn't work, but it certainly, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm being a little silly, but, but I think in that moment, you know, it completely changed my understanding of gender. It, it entirely shifted my in framework by reading one sentence where I'm like, wait, what is that word? What? And I think that that is the beauty of science fiction, that in a way that, you know, we could write 500 pages of scholarly work, you know, there could be one idea, one line in science fiction that completely destroys and rebuilds your world in a minute, right? Yeah, if I can just footnote by sending around more books, if you want to get the giver as a taste out of your mouth, there's <laughs> Needy Acora Forest Lagoon. Yes, yes. <laughs> Here's The Girl Who Grew a Galaxy, Mati writer. And then Joseph Brukuk, who's Abenaki, Killer of Enemies, in case you want something less superfluous than Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was hoping to talk to you too about how you approach science fiction in your classes because you're both academics. Um, and science fiction and academia haven't always had a great relationship. So I'm wondering, how do you use science fiction in an academic setting to sort of get people to think about the big issues you're talking about? Um, how do you approach that in your classes? And what do you, at what points do you like see it click with students? And what stuff do students struggle with the whole semester? Well, as I mentioned, I'm tenured in science fiction, so I teach entire courses <laughs> of science fiction. So, um, and in, I'm in a world of scholars with science fiction. So sometimes I tend to forget that it is viewed as aberrant in any kind of way. <laughs> now, the catch to that is then, you know, if you offer a science fiction course, you're probably drawing in students. I mean, I tend to get wonderful students that are themselves writing SF and doing all kinds of thinking with SF. So that might be a trickier kind of thing. One thing I'm doing, though, that might be a little bit more of a struggle 
is, it, and a really good one, is with race and social justice, is actually an inquiry that I'm teaching along with Michael, who's here tonight. And, um, and so I teach a lot of SF. And so when we look at the interfaces between power, technology, and race, um, it's SF stories that can get them really, really, really engaged and really involved with these actual intersections that are going on between power, technology, and race, and then be able to kind of take it back on home. Um, so I've, I actually use SF as an de allegorical device to jumpstart um, back into personal experiences in a way that's actually maybe um, more comforting. It actually provides, at least they tell me, <laughs> it provides a kind of safety net before they tell their own talk stories. Um, I try to shove science fiction in wherever I can. <laughs> like, just shove it in there. Um, so, you know, I've, I've taught classes around, uh, you know, uh, black history, and, you know, I, I'll use uh, Octavia Butler's book, Kindred. Uh, which is about a black woman in 1976 in the Bicentennial who ends up getting pulled inadvertently back into antebellum slavery times and interacting with her ancestor who is also a slave owner, a white slave owner at that time and being kind of yo-yoed back and forth between that uh, because I think that it really it makes things incredibly uh, much more real and tangible uh, for students. I think that when we talk about slavery, it's often in these incredibly vague terms, right? I, I don't use the term, you know, slave because I, that's, that's a construct and it's safe and it feels a lot easier because it's super distant, right? So I always say enslaved black people because I'm like, to be clear, these were people and they were enslaved and, uh, but they were not, uh, their identity was not as a slave. Uh, because I think it's really important to break those kind of safe walls that we put around these histories so that we don't actually have to deal with uh, how horrific they were and also how very much they walk with us today, every single day. And so uh, a book like that really allows students to think, oh my God, what if I was being pulled back into there? And for white students to think, oh my God, what if I was being pulled back into there and I... I, what if I am a slave owner? Oh my God, right? Because the other part of talking about slavery is we talk about enslaved black folks. We never talk about who enslaved them, right? In fact, history books talk about it like, well, you know, millions of black folks got enslaved. <laughs> uh, by themselves? Is it like a cult? How did, they, you know, and so, so I mean, again, what it does is it, it makes people, white people really comfortable because they, they got enslaved somehow, I don't know, and then Abraham Lincoln freed them, so you're welcome. Um, <laughs> rather than av actually having to take responsibility and say, white people enslaved them, white people who look like me, perhaps my ancestors enslaved them, and even if uh, I was not someone who would have directly owned enslaved black folks, would I have been someone who stood up against that, right? Because I think we, we have this, you know, kind of ahistoric memory about slavery. You know, we think, oh, well, everyone knew it was wrong. The vast majority of white folks felt slavery could continue in perpetuity, right? Um, and, and again, enslaved black folks were offered a kinder, gentler slavery as reform, right? That's, that's what you can get. Um, and so I think that's really important, especially when we talk about, you know, radical transformation now. Because I, you know, I think that a lot of folks, especially folks who don't experience police violence every day, are like, how could we have a world without police? right? Rewind to 1859. How could we have a world without slavery, right? These, these realities are conversations we've already had, and we've already been told that a world cannot exist beyond this limit, and we've actually, again and again, uh, you know, people of color, oppressed people have pushed beyond that limit and said, oh look, there's entire universes out here, every single one of them more just than what you have been, you know, rooting your life in. I don't even know if that actually answered the question. I don't know. <laughs> well, so, so you said that Kindred is one of the books that you have your students read, um, and you try and sort of slip those science fiction ideas in there whenever you can. So before we get started on our writing exercise that we're going to do in about eh, five or six minutes, um, I want to ask you too if you ever write science fiction and what kind of science fiction you write or have written uh, during your life. 
Uh, well, often in the past I've denied writing science fiction, uh, but actually I have, and uh, Andrea Hairston, if you guys are familiar with her, so please let me pass her around. Uh, Redwood and Wildfire, we just had her out again, and we're going to bring her out. Uh, she is African American and Cherokee, and just an amazing, amazing science fiction writer. Uh, and then I'll just sneak in Zanab Amadahe while we're at it, who's Afro-Canadian and Cherokee, who has written amazing, amazing science fiction books. The Moons of Palmaris and Resistance just came out. And I want to say that she is a social justice uh, mover. And so I really want to do that. And then wait a minute, what was that question? I was, it was supposed to be <laughs> I think you're trying. I think you're trying to avoid it. Um, okay. Yes, I have written, and now I have to confess to it because um, I, I've actually presented with Andre Hurston and um, with Cherie Renee Thomas and uh, with Pan Morrigan, and it was in fact last year. So um, yes, actually. I am writing, but the, it's very indigenous, very indigenous SF, very elliptical and poetic. <laughs> Can you tell us what it's about or what themes you're dealing with or uh, how it feels to be writing it after reading so much? Well, you know, the fascinating thing for me is I love, the, like, the longer the better, right? You know, just, ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so you think that's what I'd write. <laughs> but no, these are actually... Uh, very tight, small, the words simply pour into me while I'm lying down. I don't know if you guys have that sensation sometimes where it's just like, there it is. And it, it really is Wittgensteinian. You don't change a word and you just put it down and that's it. So strangely enough, that's the way I write. Um, yes, I write science fiction. <clears throat> I've written science fiction all my life. I wrote a epic, um, I think 400 or 500 fantasy story when I was like 11 with ogres. It was, well, it was what it was. But, um, uh, but when I became politicized, I actually was like, well, I have to stop writing this. I need to write, you know, political essays and manifestos. And I still write political essays and manifestos and poetry. And I think that every form has uh, its use. But I, I definitely have gotten back into writing science fiction. Actually, Adrian and I, when we came up with the project for Octavia's Brood, um, we said that uh, we would not feel that the the pro project was successful unless she and I both completed at least one short story, whether or not we put it in the book. And we were also like, please, we're going to be brutally honest with each other so we can be like, so sweetie, <laughs> so glad you're writing. No. Uh, and um, I feel like in the same way, I mean, we reached out to organizers who were, you know, uh, many of them who had, uh, the majority of them had never written science fiction. Most of them had never written fiction. And so uh, many of them were like, mm, I think you sent this email to the wrong person. And we're like, no, we mean you. We think you could do this. You're going to be awesome. And they're like, mm, no. And we're like, just think about it. You know, it's like asking someone on a date. N d don't say no. Just <laughs> think about it. Uh, and we went back to them a few weeks later and overwhelmingly everyone was like, oh my God, I have this, I have like 10 ideas, I've written 60 pages, blah, blah, Because I feel like all we need is a little bit of permission to open it up that, again, folks who are engaging in organizing and social change and uh, transformation every day, we're carrying all of these worlds around inside of us. We just need to crack it open a little bit. And so Adrian and I both experienced the same thing. Adrian actually just finished a draft of, um, she lives in Detroit, so Detroit-based science fiction, which is an incredible idea. Um, and I am working on uh, several projects, uh, and by that, I mean I don't actually finish anything. <laughs> um, but I have, I have a collection of short, short stories that I'm writing. I have um, two, uh, uh, science fiction novels that I'm writing, and then I have a collection of sci-fi fantastical poetry. And again, you know, um, doing all of them at once is 
perhaps like you know the way of not actually having to finish it. But I, you know, I think it's it, one of the things that's really interesting is um, is is when you're writing, and I'm right, you know, like my one of the stories I'm writing is a um, she's a fallen angel who um, becomes a reluctant superhero. Uh, Black Angel, she's like really grumpy, and and someone was like, so all of your main characters are like grumpy, big-haired black women. <laughs> and I was like, I know, right? I'm such a good fiction writer. I don't know where I get this stuff. Um, but <laughs> so she's a grumpy, big-haired black, you know, fallen angel. Um, and, you know, so I created a superhero, right? And so, but then I'm like, okay, so, but superheroes as the sort of one person saving everyone go against our principles of visionary fiction that change is actually collective and from the bottom up. And so I'm like, so what have I gotten myself into? And I think that it's been incredible to, to try and struggle with that because I think we are so indoctrinated with mainstream sci-fi that when we're writing, it just sort of comes out naturally. We're like, well, of course that's what happens next because that's what happens next all the time. And I have thrown out probably 300 pages of it, you know, over, you know, sitting and writing. I'm like, oh my God, that's so good. And then I read it back and I'm like, oh, this is not the principles that I believe. No, this is, this goes against everything I want to do, even though, damn it, it's so well written. That delete. Um, so I, I think it's been, you know, part of the reason it's taking me longer is I feel like I've really been trying to engage in this process of, of decolonizing my own imagination, right? And I think that the, the decolonization of the imagination is the most dangerous and subversive, because once that imagination is set free, we can imagine any other uh, liberation possible, right? And then we can begin to build it. So I think that part of this, the, the work of writing science fiction for me has been continuing uh, the decolonization of my imagination. Okay, so we're gonna move into the, with the part of the night where we're gonna all together write our own science fiction zine. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Ten is great. Should I make it a pile? Yeah. It's inherently going to be. There you go. There you go. Let's be the Let me punch you back. And then we'll, and then we can talk about it. It's like, I seem to be.